the Apostle Paul wrote to some Christians in a real small church in a place called Colossae. We call it the book of Colossians in your New Testament. Colossians 4 today, verses 2 through 6. So just a few verses, but lots and lots of things to consider here as we look at um, being disciples of Jesus to reach out uh, to those who are not yet in Christ and to do that in a way that reflects Jesus' heart. So Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6, we remember and we give thanks. God, thank you. You love us enough to give us your inspired, the inspired word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Have confidence that what you're about to hear is actually God speaking to us not our thoughts about God. So let's listen for God to speak through the Holy Spirit. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let's take a moment to pray. Help us, Lord. Give us the help of your Holy Spirit who um, guides and teaches us, uh, brings truth to us in ways that we can't just go and grasp. Um, So we need you for that. We pray that you would help our minds to be uncluttered, um, focused, attentive, um, so that as your Spirit speaks that we catch what you're saying. And more than that, God, that then it would actually work in us um, so that we live it. Um, So this is a good day uh, that we can worship you and hear from you. We give thanks for that and ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. So this series, um, again, is a safeguard for us as a church. Um, Churches can easily get in the habit of just kind of doing what we do, forgetting why we do it. And we always want to be really, really aware and remembering that we do this with this mission that Jesus has given us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, so that what Jesus commands us is how to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, how to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we make disciples by loving God first, loving our neighbor as ourselves, and so there's this cycle that just kind of goes on in terms of the life of the church, what we're about. And it's the how that we've been trying to to focus on. So how do I express this love so that people are drawn to Jesus? Um, And we've said Jesus' way of eating with people. We're we're trying to encourage you, and a few people have signed up. It's out at the Welcome Center. Um, If you're willing, give us your name, put it down, and say, you know what, I'd be willing to have somebody into my home just for a meal. There's no extra thing. There's not a, uh, you know, it's not going to become a Bible study. It doesn't have to be a prayer group. Just sit, eat with them, get to know them, be their genuine friend. No strings attached. Just genuine love to welcome somebody into your home. So if you're willing to do that, if you sign up, what we're going to try to do is, is connect some people with you. Some of them are people that come to worship here, but they're kind of on the outside. They're, they're still not really connected relationally. We think this would be a great way to connect them is if we could get you two together um, and have a meal together. Um, some people aren't even coming to worship here. But we know them because we know them through your lives, through our lives, where they don't know Jesus yet, but man, we just we want them to know Jesus but their first step towards Jesus is probably not going to be to come to this worship service. I mean, we try to make this as inviting a place as we can, but it's pretty intimidating for somebody who has not come to church to walk through those doors. So their first step towards Jesus, what could that be? Not sitting here hoping one day they just stumble in to the doors here, but that actually, what if we would invite them to a meal 
with some people that are just going to love on them. We think this is the way that Jesus did it, and so we want to reflect that. So if you want to be a part of that, you can sign up at the Welcome Center. Even if you don't, and some of you have been very clear in telling me this is not a season of life where you can do that or you're, you're not really up for that, that's okay. This series is still for you because, as our text even says today, no matter what circumstance you're in, our heart's goal is always to fulfill the mission that Jesus has given us. Lord, in my workplace, in school, at home, in the neighborhood, wherever it is, I'm going to look for opportunities to draw people by love closer to you. And so that's what this series is really about. So if you are here and you're not in Christ yet, if you're not yet in Jesus, I mean, I'm not saying, oh, you can say I believe in God or I've gone to church. Yeah, but that's not surrendering your life yet, surrendering your kingdom so that you can receive his life, so you can live in his kingdom. If you haven't done that yet, we just want you to know we do want to persuade you to do it, but we don't want to be pushy. Uh, We don't want to be um, kind of jerks for Jesus, the way that we would approach you um, and just hammer home on it. We want to love you to Jesus, but we want to love you to Jesus because here's the truth. Our love won't be enough for you. It just won't be. Uh, No human love will be enough. What you really want, your heart really wants, we believe this to the core, you need the love of God in Jesus Christ. And if you can be drawn to him, that's all we're trying to do. So yeah, we want to persuade you. We're going to love you whether you accept Jesus or not. I just want to tell you that up front. It's not going to change the way that we love you. But we just want you to know he's what your heart was made for. So we want to love you in all these different ways. And in this case, in these texts here in verses um, 2 through 6 of Colossians 4, how do we go about doing this in a in a very intentional way. And the first starting point, the emphasis of this text is, you got to start with prayer. You you have to start with prayer. Um, The necessity of prayer cannot be overstated. If I'm going to, and you're going to try to draw people to Jesus by loving them. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Um, That word devote, by the way, means this kind of continuous ongoing thing and I'll just say something real briefly here because I've, I've felt this from God that I this is one of the reasons why in November I'm going to do a three-week sermon series on prayer because I think there's a lot of folks that are really struggling with prayer because they are they actually have a bitterness about it because see some of you have prayed and prayed and prayed and it's not happening. You're not getting what you're asking for. And at some point, the heart sometimes gets hardened and says, either God is not as good as they keep saying he is, or this whole thing about praying really doesn't amount to anything. Like God's going to do what he wants to do, and me praying about it makes no difference. And there's a certain hardness and bitterness that can kind of build up And so in that sermon series, we're going to do it in November. It's going to be called Ask, Seek, Knock, because Jesus talks about that. Ask, and you'll be given. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. But I'm going to try to address some of the objections that people have towards prayer. I'm not going to address those today, but as this says, devote yourself to prayer. I know those are coming to mind. What's the point? Why bother doing this over and over and over? If I say it once, isn't that enough? We'll deal with those objections, but for now, recognize that the scriptures say this over and over again. Prayer can't be a one-time thing. Prayer can't be just when I'm in trouble. Prayer needs to be this ongoing, continuous devotion. I am devoting myself to being in prayer to God. When we're talking about sharing the gospel, why that's so important is this. We are not trying to, when I say becoming a Christian, accepting Christ as Savior and Lord, we do not mean that we're trying to convince people to believe a list of beliefs. See, because some people think that's what evangelism is. We just need to even get to believe the right stuff. That's not our goal. The reason that prayer is so crucial is because it's not trying to get them convinced about a list of beliefs. It's trying to introduce them to a real person, and that person is Jesus Christ. We're looking to get them into a relationship with Jesus because I promise you this, the Bible's super clear on this, 
there's going to be a lot of people who have really good theology who are going to be lost for all eternity. They're going to believe all the right stuff. They're going to say, no, I believe the Bible. I believe it's Jesus died on the cross. I, I believe all the right things, the Trinity, one God and three persons. And I believe all of that. And Jesus tells us this in Matthew 7. He's like, you know, the judgment day is going to be so surprising for some because they're going to say, I believe all the right stuff. I, I cast out demons in your name. I prophesied in your name. I did all of these things in your name, Jesus. What's the problem? And Jesus is simply going to say, I don't know you. See, it's relationship. It's not just the list of beliefs. So the reason that we pray is because we're saying, Lord, I have this friend. I want to introduce him to you so badly. They've been hurt or they've been burned or there's a lot of things going on in their life. And, and maybe that's why they haven't come to know you. But I want to introduce you to them would you help me? See, it's about this relationship. So we got to pray because we're saying, Jesus, this is the person that's on my heart to know you. We pray for God to go before us to prepare and work on their hearts so that there can be relationship with Jesus. So ultimately, prayer should be this way. Speak to God more Speak more to God about your friend than you do to your friend about God. And I mean, we're supposed to speak to our friends about God a lot. I'm just saying speak even more to God about your friend. Because you and I cannot change a heart. I, I don't care who you are. You can get a far better preacher than me. No preacher can change a person's heart. No one can take that work except for God himself. And so we're just like, God, I want to introduce, but this is going to require you. There's going to have to be some kind of intervention on your part, God. And then be devoted to that. Pray that over and over. I could ask for a, maybe a show of hands here, but think about your own giftedness, your spiritual gifts and talents. How many of you have the spiritual gift of stubbornness, right? Like that's one of your high-end spiritual gifts, right? What if you took your spiritual gift of stubbornness and applied it to prayer? Like, uh, you know, we're all kind of chuckling because we're thinking, yeah, and we're like, I could ask your spouse, and you're like, yeah, this is the most stubborn person in the whole wide world. I, I married them. I didn't know it, but they are so stubborn when it comes to, and then we kind of fill in the blank. Like, they're so stubborn about this. What if you took that same stubbornness and, and applied it to prayer so that you, like a dog to a bone, just would not give up? There's so many parables in the scriptures, Jesus telling his disciples, let me tell you about this. Why? What's the point, Jesus? So you don't give up in prayer. So you don't quit on prayer. So that you would have a devotion in your prayers. What's the longest you've ever prayed for anything. And some of you say, oh gosh, for some maybe it's years. And maybe you're still doing it right now. Like, I don't know, Cliff, it's not over yet. And I've been praying about this. I'm so challenged. If you ever read, uh, he's, a, he's a German, but he, he actually was a, a believer who lived in uh, England, George Muller. And so he, in Bristol, England, he was real famous because he started an orphanage in the 1800s and had a tremendous impact for the gospel for lots of people. But one of the primary things that just shines the light of God in his life is how he was devoted to prayer. And we know so much about it because he kept a prayer journal. And I, and I was thinking about this. Well, Cliff, what's the longest thing that I have prayed for? Longest time. And then I'm reading about George Muller. And this is what he wrote in one of his prayer journals. In November of 1844, I began to pray for the conversions of five friends of mine, five individuals, in 1844. I prayed every day without missing a single day, whether I was sick or whether I was healthy, whether I was on the land or on the sea, and whatever the pressure of my daily activities might be, I prayed every day for my five friends who were lost. 18 months elapsed before the first of the five was converted. And I thanked God, and I kept praying for the other four. Five years elapsed, <clears throat> and then the second was converted. And I thanked God for the second, and I prayed on for the other three. Day by day, 
I continued to pray for them. Six more years passed, and then the third was converted. And I thanked God for the three, and I prayed on for the other two. These two remain unconverted 36 years. And then he wrote that these other two were still not converted, but I hope in God, and I pray on, and I look for the answer. They're not converted yet, but I believe they will be one day. And the next year was 1897, and those two friends converted and became believers. He prayed for 52 years. What's the longest you've ever prayed for something? And you're like, Cliff, that's actually discouraging me right now. <laughs> 52 <laughs> years. Do you mean it might take that long? Someone who's devoted to prayer, and again, we'll deal with some of these objections and struggles that we have with prayer um, when we get into that series, but for now, just the devotion to say every day. I mean, I've got family members that I've been praying for for years, but honestly, I was really challenged because I thought, I can't honestly say that I prayed for them every day. And then I was like, why not? Why wouldn't I? <laughs> why not every day? And at some point, the devotion to pray is critical for us reaching the lost. Then, when we pray, we're praying for God to open doors. This is what Paul says. Pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message and we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. In other words, he's recognizing, yeah, the reason that we pray is because I can't change a human heart. And for a lot of human hearts, there is a really closed, locked door. Like I start to even talk about God, the conversation even generally starts to move and you can just see the hackles come up on the back of their neck and they're just like, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to talk about it, that's fine for you, but don't bring it to me, I don't want to hear about your Jesus and those doors are really, really locked and Paul recognizes that, he goes, so when you pray, think about your friend, think about the person that's going to become your friend, what is it that is a closed door? door in their life because God is the only one who can open it. But I tell you this, there is not a closed locked door that he can't open. No matter how hopeless it seems and feels, God is able to open the hardest locked door that exists. So when you pray, you're praying, God, unlock his heart, unlock her heart because, man, this door has been slammed shut and it's locked, but you can open it, God, and we need you to do that. And then trust God in it. I, I am certain. I feel real confident about this. Do you remember Saul called Paul? Saul, who before he, he believes in Jesus, is a persecutor of the church, and he's going out. He's, having, he's actually going to other cities. It's not just looking around. He's going to places, dragging Christians out of their homes, having them arrested and killed in some cases. And so he's this persecutor of the church. And I, was anybody praying for Saul? The scriptures don't tell us this, but I wonder, when they got together as a church, do we have any prayer requests today? Well, there's kind of this guy, Saul, you guys probably know him. I was thinking maybe we should pray for him, but I'm thinking that maybe the prayers were like, do you know that old country song, I pray for you? That old country song that says, oh, I pray for you. I pray that when it's your birthday, nobody remembers. I pray that when you're going downhill, your brakes go out. Just remember, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, I pray for you, that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, we pray. I'm certain they were praying, God, stop the persecution. Stop him in his tracks. Maybe even God strike him down so he stops striking your church. You say, well, how do you know that they weren't praying for his salvation? Here's my clue that they probably weren't. Because even after he actually got saved, nobody believed it. You remember they tried to, Saul wanted to come to meet with the disciples. Hey, I believe in Jesus now. And they're like, yeah, right. Uh huh. This is a trap. This is a setup. There's no way that this guy now believes in Jesus. And so somewhere along the line when we're praying for the hard hearts of people that you and your mind are like, they will never, Cliff, if they come through those doors, I think it will fall down. I think the church will come down. If that person, that's the hard-hearted person. We just trust God. We say, God, if you could change the heart of Saul, Surely you could change my friend's heart. Unlock the doors. 
God can open the doors that we can't. But what good is it for us to pray? God, open the doors of their heart if God opens it and nobody goes through. What good does it do if we say, God, open the hearts, and then God says, I'm going to open that door, but the door is open for you to go through and not the way that you think. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, like Trevor Hudson, is a, he's a pastor and theologian in South Africa, and he, he, he has this great story. He said he's had this neighbor who wasn't a Christian, and he was trying to get this person to come to believe in Christ, and he, he tried everything. He witnessed to him. He shared. He said, come to church. He said, my friend would never come. My neighbor would never come. And so he said, Trevor was off on a, a, a trip for a while. He came back exhausted. It was near the end of the day. And he says, I'm, I'm dragging home with my wife. And he says, as we come home, we pass our neighbor who's out in his front yard. And he has this tremendous pile of bricks. And he is painfully, slowly moving these bricks by putting them in a wheelbarrow and then hauling them out to the back of his yard. I don't know what he was doing with them, but it looked like this massive job. It was going to take forever. And so Trevor, he, as they got home, he said, I, f- I felt a nudging from the Holy Spirit and my wife <laughs> that I should go and help him. You should go help him. Help him out with that. It looks like a hard thing. And he's like, tired and exhausted. You know how you're at the spend at the end of the day. I don't want to go help him move bricks. And so he's, he, of course, with the nudgings, he's like, okay, I will. He said, but I'm actually, as I'm walking over to my neighbor's house, he said, I'm, I was actually thinking in my head, please say you don't need any help. Please say you don't need any help because then it's the best of both worlds. I can go back and tell my wife and the Lord, I asked him, he doesn't want any help, and so no problem. And of course, he says, I go over, I said, would you like any help with this? And not only does he say yes, but he has a second wheelbarrow. And so he says, so now I've got to help him. He said, four hours later, now we're, we're, we're into the night. He says, I come dragging home, tired, dirty, exhausted, a little cranky for Jesus, and I come in, and it's like, ah, oh, this, was, this was horrible. And you're like, could that be an open door? He wasn't thinking so, except the very next day, his neighbor asks, hey, would it be okay if I come to church with you? Do, do you see, when God opens a door, and we're thinking it's going to look like the door that we're looking for, sometimes God is opening a door, and he's saying, you go through that. Well, what good is that going to do? How's that going to change anything? I'm the one that opens doors, he says. If I want you to go through this door, would you? And that's where we pray. God, I'm asking you to open doors, but I'm asking you to give me the courage to step through the doors that you do open. And pray for clarity for your words. I know this is the scariest part because everybody's like, I don't know what to say. Like if somebody asked me to explain my faith, Cliff, it would be just a spaghetti mess on a board. I, I would have no idea how to clearly say this is what the gospel is. Well, you should pray about that. You really should. Because at some point, the scriptures are clear. I got to be able to proclaim this. I have to be able to talk about it. And you're in good company, by the way. Because the great apostle Paul felt inadequate. He did right here. He says, pray that I may proclaim it clearly. Wait, Paul, you're asking a bunch of baby Christians in a little bitty church to ask God to help you to proclaim. If you can't proclaim it clearly, what help do we have? And don't you see, he says, the only way I can do this is if God is at work in me and through me. You guys can help me by praying that I get it clear in my mind. And God, as you do that, then there becomes this this way in which I see connections. You know, honestly, and I didn't set this up with Max. Max did this perfectly during communion. Did you catch this? Max was looking at his life. I mean, his life is, for the next several weeks, is stuck inside of this tractor here. And he's got, this is what my life looks at. But he's thinking Jesus. I mean, I'm going to go home now. And I'm thinking, recentering, hit the recenter button. You know, because my life has to get recentered around. He's taking what he knows, farming, and he's connecting it to the gospel. And Jesus did this all the time. He's like, man, I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of fishermen. Peter, James, and Jan, John, and Andrew. How do I help them to see, hey, guys, I'll make you fishers of men. Hey, I, now that I can relate to. I can make that connection. 
when he meets the woman at the well. We talked about uh, last week when he meets the woman at the well and she's thirsty. How does he talk about it? Let me tell you, the gospel is like living water. Oh, I can connect with that. That makes sense to me. That's clear to me. Jesus does. He's like, if you're baking, Jesus is like, the gospel is like yeast. I get that. Do you see how you're looking at your life and you're trying to say, what is it that I do? And how can I see the gospel in such a way so that I can explain it in simple terms that someone's going to say, I get that. Well, you say, how do I get that? Pray about it. God, help me to see you everywhere. Everywhere in my life so that I can explain the truth of who you are. And then we prayed, we prayed, we're devoted to prayer. God, help me to be wise in every circumstance. Make the most of every circumstance. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Wisdom is knowing what to do for the glory of God when your rule book runs out. Like, we all want a rule book. Let me just do these 10 steps and then I'll be done. When the rule book runs out and it's like, now what do I do? That's wisdom. God, tell me now, show me now how I should respond in this particular circumstance. And this is where we really struggle because we're like, yeah, I don't act wise. Cliff, the problem is not so much me telling people about the gospel. The problem is I'm not a great Christian. I blow it. And when I mess up, I wish it was just me, but my coworkers see it. My family sees it. My neighbors see it. My friends see it. Everybody sees that I don't really measure up. And so how could I possibly look in every circumstance, every, an opportunity? What's the opportunity there when I have messed up and I've sinned? Do you realize this is a really good opportunity? Because here's one thing. It's just one thing. How about confess it? And I don't mean confess it just between you and the Lord. Do that, yeah. Well, what if we actually confessed our sins to others? What if we did this radical thing that almost never happens in our culture anymore, where we apologize? Because, see, nobody does that. In fact, it strikes us. When somebody actually takes the time to say, I blew it, and they don't shift the blame, and they don't try to cover it up, and they don't try to make themselves look better than they are, it, like, pops out in our culture because, we're like, nobody does that. What if God's people began to use every circumstance, we're wise in every circumstance, not when we're always doing well, but when we blow it by saying, you know what, i got to come back to you, and i got to apologize. I sinned. And that wasn't Jesus. You hear me talk about Jesus? That wasn't Jesus. That was me. You see any good in me? That's Jesus. And that confession is a powerful way in which we begin to say, why is it so powerful? Because the gospel is saying the only way that you have the ability, the power to confess your sins is when you have given up on self-righteousness. See, self-righteousness says, i got to make myself look good enough. And to do that, when I blow it, i got to blame somebody else for it. I've got to cover my sins. Instead, somebody who says, how can you be so free in sharing that you're messed up? Yeah, because I've given up on self-righteousness. What do you mean? There's a righteousness that comes as a gift to those who don't deserve it. And I don't deserve it. And you can see that clearly, can't you? Don't you see the opportunities? And it's not always when you're at your best but often when we're at our very worst. If we can point people to Jesus, that's why I need a Savior. What I messed up right here. Confess our sins, apologize, and look for those opportunities no matter what's going on. Uh, Paul is in jail. That's why he says, I'm in chains. I want you guys to pray for me because I want to be clear in how I share the gospel. Well, Paul, you're I know you wish you were out there sharing the gospel. It's not going to happen too much. We probably don't need to pray about that right now. When you get out, we'll, we'll pray about God giving you clarity in the way you present the gospel. And he's like, don't you realize that God has given me an opportunity while I'm in prison, while I'm in chains? What do you mean, Paul? Well, the Roman imperial guard has to get chained to me. That's how they keep me imprisoned. They get chained to me. 
Their life depends on the fact that I'm not going to get away, so they chain themselves physically to me. This is a preacher's dream because this is truly a captive audience. Like, he can't go away. He can't be like, man, Cliff has been preaching for two hours. I think we're going to have to get up and go. He can't go anywhere. And Paul is saying, do you realize this is such a huge opportunity because I get to preach the gospel to these guards day after day. And when he goes off a shift and another guy comes on, I'm going to tell him about Jesus as well. And then you start to see these little trickles in the, in the gospels or in the New Testament where you see people who are named as being someone who belongs to Herod's household who's a believer. How'd that happen? And even people who belong to Caesar's household who are now a believer. How'd that happen? Because God is infiltrating from the inside, even from prisons, the gospel, and everything's an opportunity for Paul. He's like, no, I, I see it even now. Do I wish I was in jail? No. But that's where God has me right now. So I'm going to be faithful in sharing the gospel. I have seen people in our church, this has happened multiple times. I go to visit them, they're in the hospital. Do they want to be in the hospital? No, they don't. But one of the things I go on, hey, can I pray for you? Can we pray for you? Everybody's praying for you. I want to pray for you now if I can. They're like, yeah, but let me tell you this first, Cliff. And they're excited. And I'm like, good, you got some good news from the doctor. No, 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 not that at all. But I got a chance to witness and share to one of the nurses. And I got a chance to witness to one of the doctors. I got a chance to share my faith that even though my body is really struggling and I'm in a lot of pain, God is good. And I was able to do that only because I'm in the hospital right now. And it just hits my heart. And I'm like, oh, I whine and complain about a thousand things. And God's like, look for the opportunities. Pray about the opportunities. And then when we speak and when we act, full of grace, I love this phrase, full of grace, seasoned with salt. So there's this balance. I think I mentioned this before. The biblical definition of love, what is love? It's not just warm, fuzzy feelings, and it's not just telling the truth. The Bible defines love as this, full of grace and truth, both. John 1 says Jesus comes to us, God in the flesh comes to us, how? Full of grace and truth, both of those together. You lose one, you lose love. You lose the other, you lose love. Together they are powerful. How can I show both grace and truth? Grace seasoned with salt. That's what this phrase is actually saying. So now, what does it mean to be seasoned with salt? So if you're on a low-salt diet, I know, don't worry about this right now, but salt is what makes things really taste good, right? Like if my wife is Swedish I grab the salt shaker before I taste anything. I already know it's going to need more salt, right? Because it's kind of bland. Usually that's kind of their cookbook is a blandness for God kind of thing. Here, we're going to do this for God. It's like, no, this is not I need something, something that brings the flavor out, and salt does that. So basically what it's saying is, so in your relationships, seasoned with salt, it's grace seasoned with salt, your goal, my goal is not, again, just to give the spiel, here's what you're supposed to believe. No, let me tell you about this person, but I want to do it in such a way that it whets your appetite. How can that happen? The only way that really happens in the way I've seen it is that you have to enjoy God. To the extent that you enjoy Jesus, it's going to whet the appetite, it's going to season with salt for someone else. This is a weird confession. I never tasted, not even a drop, I never tasted sour cream until after I was married. I know that sounds weird. You're like, why not? We had sour cream. It's not like it wasn't available in South Central Pennsylvania. It was all over the place. But, but I didn't want to taste it even because it starts with the word sour. And I'm like, I have tasted sour things. I do not enjoy sour things. I don't want sour cream. And I didn't know, of course, what I was missing, but until I got married, and my wife did not set about to say, you know what, we've got a lot of things to work on in our marriage. First thing is, we've got to get you okay with sour cream. She did not make that her goal. She didn't set that out to, let me, let me set you right on this. What she did was, she simply enjoyed, really enjoyed sour cream. She'd throw it on her baked potato. Oh, why would you mess up a baked potato? Oh. 
She's like, that's okay, it's more for me, she says, and she just throws it on there, and we have it in all kinds of casseroles and dishes, and at some point, I'm watching my wife enjoy sour cream so much, I'm like, maybe I should try this. <laughs> Don't you see that that's the way it works with Jesus? We try to tell people how good Jesus is. What if, and we hap- this happens, I think, the longer sometimes we walk with Jesus, we lose sight of the serious business of enjoying God, taste and see that he is good. And if I could get back to God today, yes, there's sorrows in my way, but there's always a joy that comes with it. Yes, there's struggles that I have to face, and yet you are faithful and you are good. And I want to enjoy God so much that people start to salivate just a little bit. What would it be like to have a love like that? What would it be like to have someone who is always with them and they seem to be able to call out just anytime, anywhere and know that they're heard? What what would it be like? And see, that's why Paul is saying, look, you, you do all of this, you season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Well, what questions are they asking? They're asking questions like, how can you pray for something, really pray and not get it, and still believe that God loves you and is at work for your good. Because if you enjoy God and you're like, I know he didn't give me this, but then I'm going to trust him with what I can't understand. And you begin to enjoy and savor God in that moment. They're like, how does that happen? He's that good? How can we go through stressful situations in life and feel it deeply, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4? How can you be stressed and pressed without being destroyed and crushed? How can I experience stress and know that, oh, his peace passes understanding? How can you not have all the answers? Like I ask you tough questions, and you're like, I don't know. It's a good question. Well, doesn't that undermine your whole faith? No, it doesn't at all. I can trust God with what I don't understand and not be in despair? How can we be persecuted, rejected by lots of people, and still live as if we are so fully accepted by a greater love that I can weather that storm of rejection? How how does that happen? And you're wetting the appetite of somebody. How can we have absolutely nothing and yet live with a billionaire's sense of security as if all things are yours in Christ. How how does that happen? And suddenly you don't have to tell them so much about Jesus because their appetite is going, that sounds really, really good. How can we grieve? I mean, really mourn and cry and have deep sorrow. And yet there is some joy that's deeper still under it at the same time. How is that possible? See, if we live that, It's seasoned with salt, and people are like, I think I want a taste of that. Paul's like, pray about that. I mean, live in such a way that requires an explanation. How about that? Live in such a way that requires an explanation because it doesn't fit the world's view of how life should go. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Paul says here. I'll close with this. One of my favorite examples of this. John Dixon, Christian author, um, and uh, from uh, Australia. And he came to Christ when he was a teenager, but he describes that a little bit uh, more in, de- in detail. Um, <clears throat> it came through the witness of a particular woman named Glenda. And he said, this was years ago. He said in Australia at the time, they had a, a program where public schools actually invited someone from a local church to come and teach the Bible as one of the classes in the public school curriculum. I know that's miles away from where we're at nowadays, right? But that was the deal. And so the church sent just not a pastor, just a person who loved Jesus named Glenda. And Glenda came, and on Friday afternoons, they would have the class. And then after school on Fridays, she doubled down on it because she invited everybody in her class. Hey, we've had this class. If you want to come over to my house for some snacks after school. Well, if you're talking to 15-year-olds, 
Food, I mean, there, there's the connection. Food, free food, absolutely. She, and he said, so we were all going over to Glenda's house after school, and we loved the snacks, but she always gave the snacks and talked about Jesus. And so there was this constant kind of, yeah, you're going to have to hear about Jesus, but there's really good food. So we'd show up. And he said, and as we did this week after week, it became apparent that Glenda liked us. And he said it was really odd because we didn't see a whole lot of Christians who actually liked non-Christians. And that kind of hit us. So it was really great. He said, so we kept showing up. He said, but we still had our problems and issues. We were still not living, you know, to, for Christ's glory at all. He said, so he said, we had one party one night. And he said, one of my friends, Daniel, got super, super drunk, passed out kind of drunk. And he said, we were afraid to take him home because Daniel's dad was an alcoholic and he would beat Daniel if Daniel, whenever Daniel got drunk. I know there's irony there. He said, but he would beat him and we're like, we can't take him home. What are we going to do with Daniel? And we all kind of thought the same thing. We got to take him to Glenda. So he said, it's almost midnight. We knock on Glenda's house. We're dragging Daniel up to the door. We knock on the door. And we didn't know it at the time, but Glenda had thrown this huge party that evening for some of the most influential, important people in the town. And so everybody's kind of dressed up to the nines like this. is You don't have to do this if you're going to invite people over. But they had a, a big dress-up kind of meal. And he said, it was winding down. It was pretty late. He said, but we, she opened the door. Glenda opened the door, and she saw us there, and she said, what happened? And we explained to her what the situation was. And he said, without without even blinking, she said, come on in. And she said, he said, what really struck me is that she was not ashamed in front of these really important people. She wasn't sneaking us around the back corner. She just brought us in. And she said, come with me back to the guest bedroom. She got some clothes out. We plopped Daniel on the bed and she said, look, get him cleaned up, get him a shower, get him cleaned up, put this clothes on him. He can stay here tonight. So he stayed there that night. She, he, John said, we left. We came back the next morning. We come in, and there's my friend Daniel, he said, sitting at the table, enjoying a breakfast that Glenda was making for him, and just chatting. And we came in, and we're like, what, what happened? We realized in that moment, no, this, this is the very love that she's been telling us about. That This is the very love that... She's been trying to pour into our lives. This is God. And John became a Christian. His friends became believers. Why? All because of Glenda. What was really interesting to me was, he said years later, he started a ministry. John did. John Dixon did. And he said, I, I just wanted to go back and just kind of pick Glenda's brain for how she did what she did. And he said, I, we asked her. We said, Glenda, what, what was the secret like, what was, the, what was the secret for how well that you witnessed to Christ? And he said, I was ready to write down with my notebook all sorts of really great bits of wisdom. She said, I'll just tell you one thing. She said, we prayed. She said, a bunch of us moms, I'm thinking moms in prayer. This is before moms in prayer. A bunch of us moms got together at the beginning of the year, and we decided we were going to pray devotedly for all of you students. And that's what happened. God brought you. God rescued you. God saved you. And he said, I was so disappointed because I needed more bullet points. I needed more information. Really, it's just prayer? That's it. Devote yourselves to prayer. Uh, have this, this great opportunity with grace, full of grace, seasoned with salt, to just savor Jesus in front of a dying world. And say, yeah, that's what we're about. And when we blow it, we say, that's right, that's why we're saved by his grace, not by our works. And when you think of these connecting points, God, help me to explain the gospel in a way that I can get through this metaphor, this parable. Help me to express that to my friend. And the God who loves your friend and the people that you're going to meet more than you and I will ever know, he will be with you. Let's pray.